would be honored if you would join us. Greetings, and welcome to another YouTube episode of Film Stories with me, Dan Cooper. Now, today we are going to start a, a, a two-part series um, where we're going to look at a film which really shifted perceptions in Hollywood in a number of ways. And that film is Christopher Nolan's 2005 Batman Begins. It's perhaps one of the best examples of a studio valuing um, an intellectual property, like the character of Batman, to the point where, where that studio are prepared to take their time and really explore every available creative option to produce the best film possible. Um, this this is particularly interesting, um, as we talked last week about uh, Spider-Man um, and how Sony handled him. And I just thought it'd be interesting to have a look at the way that, um, that, that, that Warner Brothers dealt with the Batman character uh, and that IP in the wake of um, 1997's Batman and Robin. So we spoke last week um, about how Sony's overexposure of the Spider-Man franchise led to them essentially returning creative control of the character back to Marvel. Sony put out five Spider-Man films in around 12 years, um, all featuring Peter Parker as the, as the titular webhead, and with at least three of those five films dealing, uh, being some kind of origin story in some way. Um, and that's not to mention the, the various spin-offs that were constantly in development, the shared universe that Sony announced, um, and it's fair to say that overexposure to the character um, played a significant role in the diminishing financial returns that Sony experienced. Um, in the case of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, um, with the film that kind of finished Sony, um, uh, Sony's creative input into the, the, the Spider-Man character, not, of course, including into the Spider-Verse, the feature-length animation. Uh, but in terms of The Amazing Spider-Man series, that, that series ended because uh, Sony only really made $20 million dollars um, off the back of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, uh, reportedly, that being the ultimate reason for why we never got the, the planned third film in that series. So if you rewind back to 1997 then, uh, Warner Brothers found themselves in something of a similar position uh, with the Batman character. So Batman and Robin had released, and despite the fact that it, it grossed almost a quarter of a billion dollars worldwide, which is no small change, it still didn't do the business that they expected, uh, despite you know, all the, the, the sales of all those toys as well, for which the movie was clearly made to shill. But critically, it was derided. It was torn apart by both critics and fans. Uh, Joel Schumacher had directed the film, along with his predecessor, Batman Forever, and he, even he's been quite upfront and, and sincere in the years hence about his part in making a film that, uh, to quote George Clooney, um, you know, who played the Dark Knight in, in Batman and Robin, killed the Batman. Um, Clooney's been quite front about it as well, about the fact that the, that film was a franchise killer. Um, so in the first part of this, this, this journey to, towards Nolan's 2005 Batman Begins, I'm going to look at some of the other aborted attempts that were made to resurrect the, the Batman IP uh, in the wake of Batman and Robin before uh, next episode we'll look at um, the eventual choice of Nolan as director and, and Batman Begins as a project and, and look at how that film was brought to life. So, uh, and, and of course, and how it was such a successful reimagination, um, perhaps one of the most successful reboots that we've, we've seen. Um, so in the wake of Batman and Robin's release, before it suffered you know, what can only really be described as a, as, a, as a critical mauling, Warner Brothers were all geared up to give Schumacher the keys to the Batcave again. Um, in a film that was set to be named Batman Unchained, Joel Schumacher wanted to um, return to the franchise, but with a darker film, uh, which is an approach that he'd apparently wanted to um, adopt when making Batman and Robin, but Warner Brothers pushed him in, the, in that direction um, because they were burnt by the, the, the substantial loss of profit from Tim Burton's sequel from the, uh, Batman Returns, which, of course, took a, a, a darker drift. And they'd been burnt by that, so they pushed him in the opposite direction towards a film that would be more toyetic, to use that fantastic word. Having done their bidding with Batman and Robin, he, he made a film that was you know, kind of day glow. Uh, Chris O'Donnell once described it as essentially making a toy advert. Um, uh, Schumacher was adamant that his next film, his third film in the, in the um, in what would be his trilogy film, I suppose, in the Batman saga, would be darker, would be more psychological. And he wanted to even go so far as to bring back villains from Burton's two movies to kind of close the tonal gap um, between the two directors' braces of films. Films which were theoretically set within the same cinematic universe, but never really seemed to be so in any meaningful way. 
So Schumacher has gone on record since saying that he want, he visited, visited the set Face Off, actually, the John Woo movie, to talk to Nicolas Cage, specifically about playing the Scarecrow. Uh, and one element of the Batman Unchained plot that um, would coincidentally be used in eventually in Batman Begins uh, was th- that use of, of the Scarecrow um, and Batman having to face, face fears. So um, Mark Protisevich was uh, hired to write the script and he submitted his first draft and he was told by Schumacher that by um, including appearances from uh, Jim Carrey as the Riddler, Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman, Danny DeVito as the Penguin and even Jack Nicholson as the Joker with them all slated to make um, appearances of, 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 of various degrees of magnitude. Uh, Schumacher told him that he'd pretty much written the most expensive film in history. And of course, the, the other interesting part here was Warner Brothers. Um, and when they didn't get back to Protosevic straight away, uh, he tried to reach out to them uh, to find out whether the script was moving ahead. And as, as time went by and the, the, the lack of contact um, became glaring, the writer began to uh, realise that... Um, the, the, the script and the project probably wouldn't be going ahead. And, and on Warner Brothers' side, the, the vilification of, of Batman and Robin um, had made them stop and, and just take take a breath to think about um, the value of their of their product um, and and whether that film had hurt the future value of their product. And executives at Warner Brothers began to slowly cool on the idea of Schumacher returning to the franchise, um, and they cast it now to start to find alternative takes. They didn't immediately um, drop the idea of Schumacher returning because he, uh, he actually, along with the, uh, the Batman Unchained script, they, they also had another script in mind with, that Schumacher would direct, and that would be Batman Dark Knight, or one word. And uh, Batman Dark Knight was the screenwriters with Lee Shapiro and Stephen Wise, and it's a really good piece in uh, Hollywood Reporter, actually, which looks at some of these Batman projects. Um, and Batman Dark Knight, you can also read online. It was released eventually, um, in uh, uh, the screenplay was released as um, a book, so you can actually pop, uh, pop onto your um, bookseller of choice, and, and you can find that and have a read of it. So um, it was an interesting story because it carried on um, perhaps more so than the other previous films in the Batman saga so far. It took threads that were explored in the previous films and began to develop them. It also it featured the Scarecrow as well, who clearly was a popular villain at that time, as well as featuring uh, a, a quite a significant character arc for what would have been Harley Quinn's first appearance and with Courtney Love. Um, very interested in the role to the point when she had uh, a few lunches with the screenwriters. Um, so the film, uh, sorry, so the, so the script um, was yeah, an inter- interesting one. It's part of a, of a kind of wider trilogy that would be very much focused in the first film, especially around uh, Dick Grayson um, and his kind of moving, eventual moving away from the Batman and Robin partnership before becoming Nightwing. And so the script really focused on the uh, uneven power balance between Batman and Robin and gave Dick Grayson's character a, a, a really full um, narrative arc that eventually was designed to be part of a trilogy where he'd move away from uh, the shadow of the Batman and, and become he, uh, a hero in his own right under the, the guise of Nightwing. But Warner Brothers were kind of hot and cold on the idea and eventually um, they, they, they informed the screenwriters that they were planning to move in a different direction, of course. And that really signalled the end of of, of Schumacher's chances of returning for a third film as well, as he was slated to direct that film originally, um, but um, it then became clear that Warner Brothers, um, as the fallout from Batman and Robin continued, uh, it it, it was time to press the reboot button. So George Clooney and Chris O'Donnell were uh, moved off the project, um, as was Schumacher. And the next project was a, re- a really interesting one. Um, so uh, it was the uh, Warner Brothers got in Frank Miller, who of course was you know, famous for really revitalising the, the Dark Knight's fortunes in, in the medium of comic books in the in the eighties. Um, the character was really uh, not in the doldrums as such, but just had perhaps lost a lot of the identity that made him the Dark Knight, uh, and, and really that was found again with uh, Batman Year One which was an origin um, story of sorts, which just took the core elements of the Batman mythos uh, uh, and gave them a grittier, darker edge. 
it was a smash success, and so therefore it was no surprise that Warner Brothers looked to this property, Batman You Want, to look uh, at ways of rebooting the, the Batman IP. And, of course, it made sense to do that because, it, as an origin story, it gave new fans a, a way in. Um, and getting Frank Miller on board was something of a coup as well because of his status with, with fans. So you certainly have the, 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 the Batverse uh, on, on one side, should you have a, a writer with the status of Miller. On board, and for a director, they picked uh, Darren Aronofsky, who, of course, has always been um, a director to choose interesting projects. And the two began to work together. And um, what they came out with in the end was surprisingly, uh, had moved surprisingly rather far away from the, the source material penned by Miller. Um, and Miller's said since that he's normally um, been a part of a writing partnership because, of course, he had been involved with films before, such as Robocop 2. He said when he was involved in um, writing partnerships before for film, he always feels like the maverick out of the two, but he said that Aronofsky really was the one who came in with the mind-bending ideas. And the, the story moved further away from the original comic book to the point when uh, there was all kinds of interesting um, differences. Um, and when they presented that to, to the studio... Um, a Batman who lived on the streets as a as a hobo for a while. Um, it, it moved so far away from the story that I think Warner Brothers were expecting that they um, they balked at it. And uh, Aronofsky and Miller were so intent on the project that they they simply really refused to budge creatively, and that meant studio and writers were at loggerheads, and the project began to lose its impetus. Uh, so. At that point, of course, running parallel to uh, Warner Brothers' deliberations with the Batman character were, were, the, were similar deliberations with the Superman character because Warner Brothers were also eager to get Superman started again, the Superman franchise started again, but were also being equally careful to not make a misstep. And one idea that was mooted was to perhaps, and this, of course, was, was a help 10 years or so before it would eventually happen, was to get Batman versus Superman up on the screen. So take DC's two really biggest characters, perhaps comic books' two biggest characters, put them, uh, give them equal billing on, on the screen and you know, watch the money just roll on in. And they got Wolfgang Peterson um, as, as a director in to have a look at this. Uh, they got uh, Akiva Goldsman was, was at least one of the writers on the project. And it, it seemed like a surefire hit. But it, as, as they began to develop it, it, it would bo- borrow elements from Frank Miller's other great work, The Dark Knight Returns, which of course features um, a, a kind of classic confrontation uh, of ideologies, The Dark Knight versus The Man of Steel. And it would feature the Lex Luthor, the Joker, and would, would kind of pick up with both characters later in their careers. Um, and it's a fascinating idea, and one really that Zack Snyder would borrow um, heavily from um, The Dark Knight Returns in his own Batman vs. Superman film. But it was, a, it was a, a, an idea with, with a potentially huge payoff, but potentially huge risks as well, because if the film didn't work, then Warner Brothers were concerned that they would uh, damage both of their prize IPs. And so the idea kind of floated around for a while bef- before Warner Brothers perhaps decided to uh, move down a more careful path of um, creating two separate films, just in case one didn't work, they wouldn't be hurting both of their properties together. And so it got to the point then when by now about about eight years had passed, lots of different properties had been explored, lots of different projects had been explored. There was a Batman Beyond project as as well when they were really looking at kind of different ideas, uh, which had some of the original um, teams such as Paul Dini involved. Um, But then Nolan came along and... um, I suppose what the, the, the project that Nolan was offering, by this point he was coming off the back of a couple of really successful films and different films as well. Memento was a, a, a kind of huge breakout indie hit and he'd also made Insomnia, which showed he could you know, work um, within the studio system and, and work with stars as well, and Pacino and, um, and Williams in that film um, and, hand, and you know, handle the... the, the, the the studio side of things, as well as making films that were creatively different, uh, but also audience accessible. And Warner Brothers liked that. So when they got 
uh, Nolan's pitch, I think perhaps what swung it for him as well as his, his credentials was just the fact that he was he seemed to be looking for a sense of reality which was was not not present in perhaps some of the other more comic book oriented um, pitches. So the sense of reality, uh, Nolan himself has, has likened it to um, Christopher Reeve's Superman films, Donna Superman's films, uh, which seemed grounded in, in in a sense of reality, and that felt like such um, uh, the very very anti- antithesis of of the, of the cartoony, over the top, neon splashed, toyetic Batman and Robin Schumacher um, film. That it, perhaps they Warner Brothers believed that it, the, the polar opposite would be the approach that audiences would appreciate, and so. Batman Begins got the green light, Nolan got the green light, and he set the film into production. And there we're going to leave it, and we'll come back uh, perhaps next episode and look at how Batman Begins was made. It's a fascinating story um, from the size of the production um, and and the film story itself, but we'll get into that next episode. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like, please do subscribe. It really helps. Um, do, do go and check out Film Stories Issue 4, which is now on sale. You can find uh, links to subscribe, links to buy single issues on our website at filmstories.co.uk. You can check out podcasts or uh, any good podcast provider. You can also find us uh, on Film Stories at Film Stories Online and on Twitter at filmstories.pod. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Uh, and we'll look at Batman Begins in another film story. Bye-bye.